on Ken Moss. And I'm the uh, 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 Eric Noah Fire Professor of Jewish History uh, and also the head of the Greenberg Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, on behalf of the Greenberg Center, I welcome you uh, and I welcome uh, our uh, audience. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to present to you tonight uh, a talk by uh, someone we've been lucky enough to have as a guest, uh, a Greenberg professor here for this last quarter. Some of you I know have studied uh, with our guest, and uh, uh, hope we'll be able to have him back sometime soon. So, but that's really <laughs> up to you. Uh, so, I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce uh, Oka Ashkenazi, Associate Professor of History and Director of the Kotner Minerva Center for German History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, he currently serves as Vice Dean for Teaching Affairs and Humanities, so he's paying off some kind of karmic debt, I guess. Uh, he's the author of four monographs that explore uh, the Jewish contribution to German national culture throughout the 20th century, uh, including Weimar Film and Modern Jewish Identity from 2012, Anti Heimat Cinema, The Jewish Invention of the German Landscape from 2020, and the forthcoming Still Lives Jewish Photography in Nazi Germany. He's published articles and edited books on various topics in German and Jewish history, including memory, culture in Germany and Israel, Nazi related humor in Germany, Jewish youth in Nazi Germany, German Jewish immigrants in Mandate Palestine, the German anti war movement, and exile photography. Uh, he's again in Chicago as the Joyce Greenberg Visiting Professor, and he'll speak to us tonight uh, on how civil society saved and will possibly destroy Israel October 7th in the future of Israel's democracy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ashkenazi. Thank you very much. Ben, um, let, me, let me say something. Uh, there is something that is not sure uh, about how to uh, introduce me. Huh? As of today, I'm no longer an associate professor. Oh! <laughs> My mother doesn't care, so she's still. <laughs> sure, she does. <laughs> Yeah, um, so thank you very much for inviting me. It's been uh, a great time in, in Chicago. I, I had um, a lot of fun teaching here and, and meeting with people. Um, as Ken said, I, I, I will talk today about something that is not my expertise. And I think what I can offer is some observations, some speculations, and uh, maybe a, a, good, a good basis for, for uh, discussion. Um, let me begin with a personal story. On October 11, four days after Hamas launched its attack, um, I was in uh, Sderot, the town of Sderot, not far from the border with Gaza. You can see it on the map. I go there as part of an effort of a volunteer organization. Uh, it called itself, um, it calls itself uh, Brothers in Arms. Uh, the organization sought to rescue civilians from places that were still considered war zones uh, at the time. I, I, I'm not a member of the organization. I just saw the posting and I thought it will, it will be uh, you know, interesting. Um, they organized rescue operations for people at the war zones. The operations were um, organized, I, I wanted to say like a military operation, but it's not like a military operation. They, they were organized like a fantasy, like a Hollywood fantasy of military operation. Everything was just working as it should be without uh, no problems. Uh, we were grouped into teams. We downloaded special apps that we will be in contact all the time. Uh, we received intel on the uh, on the people we need to to get from the town and bring them outside of the of the war zone. Um, so everything was very clear to everyone. And we drove in into the town. Uh, and once we got into the town, the, the first impression is just is just a shock. Um, more than what you see now, um, the shock is the emptiness. Like there was no, there was no military there. There was no police. There was no, um, you know, municipality services. It was just empty. Um, so we were, our, what we needed, we, I was in a team with another person. I don't own a weapon. He does. So I was the driver. We drove inside. We, uh, we were supposed to find the, uh, a person um, and his daughter, he was like 50 something and his daughter. 
Um, we had the address, but we couldn't find it because the GPS didn't work. Um, the place was was constantly bombed at that time, but there were no sirens because the sirens didn't work. So it was it was totally surreal. Um, so we, we eventually we found the place. We went to the to the the parking lot. We we called them to come down, and they were supposed to come down, get into their car, and then drive after us outside of the, the town. What happened is that once we called them, I think like seven seconds after that, they were down, running, like I've never seen anything like that, running to their car. Um, and, and just, you know, igniting it and, and just starting driving like, like they were in, in a robbery, um, a bank robbery or something. They just drove away. We couldn't keep up with them, even though we were supposed to, um, to, be, to accompany them. What I what I can't erase from my memory is the look that I got from the from the person when he got down from the building. Uh, it was it was a look of terror, of helplessness, of there's nothing I can do, just run, escape from here. Um, I saw this look somewhere else uh, a few days after that um, in a place called En Vashash. It's a small community of Palestinian shepherds who lived by a small spring that provided water to villagers and goats in the West Bank. The uh, community of, of, shepherds, of Palestinians had been bullied before by Jewish settlers, but since the war broke out, the, the, the communities in the areas were um, suffered bullying that turned into uh, death threats, destructions, and looting. The settlers fenced the spring, the water, so they can't use the, the water. Um, and then they came um, to the village, started to ruin houses. Then they came with trucks to, um, to you know, build a new road uh, through the village. Um, I was, uh, so, so this, is the, this is the area, and you can see um, the green, uh, the green dots is uh, like um, communities that were expelled by, by settlers. We were where the red uh, circle is. Um, I was there as part of an organization it's called Looking the Occupation in the Eye. It's an NGO that seeks to raise awareness to protect the, um, the people from the settlers' violence. Again, I'm not part of this organization. I was curious and I joined them. Uh, when we got there, when we got there, um, that was after the villagers decided to leave. They can't. They didn't want to to stay there. They were afraid to uh, to stay. They just asked us to uh, to be around so that uh, settlers would not come and and um, hit them or or take their stuff uh, as long as we are there. Um, above our head hovers a drone from the nearby settlements to see where, that we are there, so we knew that we, we should stay. Uh, Outraged, some of us helped um, with dismantling the houses. What you see there on the right um, is helping just taking the houses down. Um, the less, less experience among, uh, among us insisted that we need to call the military to protect the, the community against the settlers. Uh, the result of that attempt was devastating. We learned that the illegal outpost settlement that expels the shepherds is located actually in the backyard of a nearby military base. The local officer declared that uh, he thinks that what they're doing is just fine, and he actually gave them the order to, to pave a new road through the village. Um, by 4, by 4 p.m., we wanted to leave. It, it became dark. We wanted to leave, and then it was the time where I saw again the, this look in the eye of, please stay. They were terrified, terrified and helpless again. This happens again. You see these looks, or you saw these looks um, after October 7 in many places. Uh, this one is in um, the uh, civilian board, uh, civilian road war room, or civilian war, war room in Jerusalem. Um, that cater for evacuees from the Gaza area and the um, Lebanon border area. 
that uh, made their way to Jerusalem without clothing, without warm meals or food or anything, and people come and beg um, that you will give them, uh, you will give them food. Um, what all of these have in common uh, is that the state was simply not there. The state of Israel disappeared. Um, and, and was just not there to give any help to anyone. And the second thing that all of these um, all these NGOs that helped had in common is that the, the activists, by and large, participated in the protest against the government uh, in the months before, constantly, uh, consistently for, for nine months before. And they were using, that will be a part of my argument, they were using the uh, networks and resources of the protest protest NGOs um, to act fast and to act effectively. I would like to briefly explain how come they did have this effective uh, infrastructure for that. We need to know what they uh, were set against. So you probably heard about it, but uh, the election of uh, 2022, November 2022, ended in Israel in almost a time, 2 million and uh, 360,000 for the uh, votes for the coalition, 2 million 331,000 votes for the opposition, so 30,000 votes um, gap. Um, however, uh, due to the uh, elections law in Israel, about 400,000 votes were not counted, 300,000 there, but 300,000 of them were of um, opposition votes. Um, so it ended up with the seats in the parliament uh, with a big majority of 64 seats versus uh, 56 seats. Um, the government was sworn into office on December 29th. Uh, a week later, on January 4th, the new law minister, um, Levine, introduced uh, his plan for judiciary reform. Four laws that grew to seven laws. Um, the laws were designed to undermine the possibility of any agency outside of the government, and particularly the Supreme Court, to critique or prevent any government policy or legislation. Now, it is an old conflict in modern democracy. The government normally wants to increase its power over other governments' uh, authorities, the other authorities, or the opposition fights back and so forth. However, these specific new laws, and the particular way they were phrased, emphasize that this government doesn't see it as yet, um, yet another version of the old type of war between, brand, between the branches. The being sought to eliminate any criticism and, yeah. Sorry. And, <laughs> and any practical limitations of the government policies. Uh, there were laws such, um, you know, that uh, extreme, if, if a law is extremely unreasonable, yeah. um, uh, the court can, can overrule it. That, that, was, uh, that was canceled. Uh, the government, uh, the government possibility to disregard the court order, the overcoming clause, uh, politicization of the of the legal authority within the ministries, and the government will solely appoint judges and so on and so forth. Now, why would they do? They want to do that. Um, and, and I simplify here, but but stay with me. Um, the first reason is uh, to institutionalize corruption. The government uh, is led by uh, several convicts. Many of, uh, many of them were tried for corruption. Uh, they sought to institutionalize it, Netanyahu uh, included. Uh, this is just a, a few of them, and you can see that uh, people have multiple, multiple conviction of corruption and so forth. Even those who would, were not um, convicted got, um, they were, uh, police uh, investigations that uh, found, um, you know, soft cases of of corruption, like um, hiring hiring family members, hiring party members, and so on and so forth. Um, so that was that was an incentive to make that legal. The second incentive 
was to uh, maintain sectorial privileges. Uh, there is no Israeli law that promises equality before the law. The court has ruled that equality is a basic human right um, and it, uh, it fits a basic, other basic laws and therefore Israel should maintain it. Um, this is problematic, especially for ultra-Orthodox Israelis who seek to maintain and extend some privileges, uh, not to be drafted, of course, uh, but also like what happened recently to receive funding for the, from the government for private um, schools, whereas other private schools um, would not get this funding, and whereas uh, public school getting defunded. So the court would not allow it on the clause of equality, but if you don't have to listen to the court, it's not a problem. And of course, there is the uh, redemption uh, section, um, the settlers. The Israel Supreme Court legitimized the settlement in the West Bank and Gaza. It was very lenient towards uh, settlements and uh, towards the occupation of the, of the West Bank. Um, but it was more restrictive when it came to seizing Palestinian private lands. Um, and also it restricted, uh, restricted race-based policies biases, uh, and biases within Israel. So the radical right in the government uh, thought that uh, this was a, an unrecurring opportunity now to move forward with his, uh, with his issues, with his law. Uh, I talked about seven, there are actually uh, 141 initiative, legal initiatives um, of this government to just cover everything. Jesus Christ. <laughs> the, the fundamental claim behind the uh, what this government was uh, was doing is the court was that because it is in power, because it has a coalition, um, the government represents the real, the true will of the people, and hence should not be restricted by other non-elected um, civil servants and, and other authorities. Go back to that. Um, so it was made clear from the very beginning that the struggle is between two perceptions of democracy. On the one hand, liberal democracy with the separation of power, a system of check and balances, and commitment to maintain basic human rights. Um, and on the other hand, a populist democracy, uh, or as the historian uh, Jacob Talmon called it, a democratorship, uh, where the ruling coalition has unlimited power. I would like to say two things here. Um, and, at the risk that uh, it sound, um, might sound strange, uh, but I will say it anyway. First, there is a historical precedence to the deterioration of democracies into democratorships. A very good example for that is Germany in the early to mid 1930s. The interesting parties are not ideological, although some Israeli ministers are not far from that, but rather the, um, the practice of getting rid of liberal democracy and its institutions, um, including the uh, eradicating the professional civil service uh, and so forth, and, and including the argument that uh, this is actually the real democracy, what we, what we are doing. Um, as in Germany, the Israeli government sought to reach quickly to a point of no return. That was the, the bombardment of, of legislation was in order to do that, to get to a point where after a few months, um, this will be very hard or maybe impossible to change, to change back. Um, by, the, by late winter of 2023, Israel was getting close to this point of no return. And the second point I would like to make, um, which is a little ironic, before January 2023, before Levine started with the whole initiative, Israel was actually heading slowly but surely in the direction that the current coalition wanted. Liberal middle class um, seemed to be in deliverance, seemed to be depoliticized, whereas uh, many of the um, government uh, and, and its apparatus was taken by um, 
let's call it conservative and some even radical um, right uh, representatives. Uh, the Supreme Court went more and more conservative and more and more um, in agreement with, with what the government wanted to do, but they just wanted to do it um, in one blow, fearing that these trajectories might change in the future. This is why the uh, protest movement was so surprising and so important. It crucially delayed and arguably, at least temporarily, prevented their revolution from taking place. It surprised both the government and the political opposition, which um, also in the in the first months after January 19, uh, January 2023, um, was also absent from the from the scene, or comparatively absent from the scene. In retrospect, however, the fast and effective reaction did not come out of nowhere. It was rather a conclusion, the conclusion of the history of protest in Israel. I would like to mention a few landmarks of this history and, and its impact. The social justice protest of, of 2011, also against Netanyahu's government, was comparatively short-lived with very limited results. Yet it showed the potential of a broad coalition of protesters. The protesters of the uh, protesters in 2011 struggled to maintain um, to maintain the, the protest as what they call non-political, namely without being associated with certain political party or even with the opposition to the government in general. That allowed them to assemble tens of thousands of protesters, sometimes even more. Um, who could join the rage against the social policies of the government without aligning himself with the uh, so-called left. Um, also, we have to... Um, oh, yeah. An image from that. Um, we also have to remember that the history of Israeli protests, um, the ones that were considered sectorial were never successful. Um, the the Wadi Salim of uh, the 1950s was considered a Moroccan Jew problem. The Black Panthers of the uh, of the 1970s were Mizrahi problem, um, and even the the protests from the right in 2005 against the uh, the withdrawal from the Gaza Strip uh, was considered a sectorial problem and never uh, reached the, the never reached popular uh, support. Um, the one that did. Succeed was the one um, after the Yom Kippur War in 1974, um, where uh, it, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was a protest that both left and right wingers could find their place in, um, and it was very effective. It ended with uh, Golda Meir's eventual resignation, not before she won the elections again, but um, but in choose. Um, so, so the 2011. Protest went in this direction to make it apolitical or as broad as possible, uh, but it also showed the limits of being apolitical. It was hard to pressure the, gov the government when you declare in, in advance that you do not seek to replace it. Um, the 2011 protesters um, also thought the, the I'm sorry, uh, the 2011 protest also taught the protesters uh, the importance of ideological education. Coping trends from protests in Western Europe and North America, Occupy Wall Street, and so forth. Um, the protesters organized educational meetings with, acti with activists and university professors who explained the principle of economic policies, social justice, etc., and elaborated on the problems with the government policies. Another thing that uh, became apparent for the protesters of 2011 is the inability to continue for a long time without an organization, a mechanism for decision-making, division of labor, agreed upon spokespersons, and money. The Black Flag protest movement of 2020 studied the lesson um, of the 2011 failure. They started in May 2020 when Netanyahu was first indicted for corruption and called for his res resignation. 
they successfully initiated a new type of protest, a weekly gathering, once a week, every Saturday night, in central urban places, most, uh, most notably Rabin Square in Tel Aviv and the Prime Minister's home in Jerusalem, but also next to home of ministers, as well as in, uh, as you can see here, crossroads and bridges across the country. It went on until the elections of June 2021, and according to, the, to polls, some 10% of Israelis participated in some of these gatherings. So it was much bigger than the, than the previous one and, and lasted much longer. The um, 2020 protest, uh, protest maintained its power for a long time um, through a constant intense use of social media, generating different content to different uh, ages, different locations, and different political leanings. Moreover, it was based on local grassroots, grassroots initiatives, um, but it, it was organized and coordinated by civil society organizations, which promoted various agendas before that. Uh, the movement for quality government, the movement for uh, new civil contract, uh, another one, Rise Up Israel, and uh, anti-occupation movement, Zazim. The 2023 protesters learned from these precedents, both from the success and from the mistakes. First, the infrastructure of protest was already in place by the veterans of 2020. Um, they reignited the same form of protest of 2020 and 2023 based on the same principle of local initiatives and coordination of larger demonstrations in the cities. From the beginning, it involved civil society organizations uh, that some were active before that, some were dormant, but active um, in the past, and some were established ad hoc um, uh, to raise money for the demonstration, to coordinate them with the police, to ensure the existence of broad coalition, and so forth. Um, those demonstrations are very expensive. You have to pay for uh, the police, the security, you have to pay for, for microphones, speakers, and so forth, it, it costs millions, and they had to um, get donations again and again and again for, for months. So, so it was very well um, coordinated operation. Um, in some places, it meant agreement of coexistence between the militaristic Brothers in Arms organization and the radical left organization looking the occupation in the eyes, both I mentioned before. Uh, you can see here, um, for example, on the left, you can see the, you know, the very uh, left kind of mark, the rally, the Pride Parade in Jerusalem with the um, Brothers in Arms representatives. Uh, you can see on the right, um, you know, Brothers in Arms, you see the, the girls in the, in the green shirt uh, next to ultra-Orthodox. Some ultra-Orthodox were against the, uh, the legislation, they became part of this coalition. Um, so, so they did it in a very smart way to keep the coalition intact. Um, the government supporting pundits realized that this was the, the Achilles heel of the protest, uh, and they emphasized the presence of a few uh, Palestinian flags among the, the left wing, the left wing protest, and and in order to show that it's actually a radical left kind of protest. Um, it was a problem in some cases. Um, Anti-occupation demonstrators were pushed out of the crowd, as you can see here in, this, uh, in these pictures. But eventually, uh, before it became a, a huge conflict, the organizers, and again, they had this coalition of NGOs sitting together and, and deciding what to do. And, and the, um, the solution they found was a brilliant one. They uh, used the Israeli flag as their main accessory. So uh, everybody was with flags, everybody with uh, Israeli flag, and if there were a few Palestinian flags, you can't even find a way to, uh, to take a picture of them without all the Israeli flags in the background. So uh, it works very well. Um, but this, um, as I said, they could show that they are apolitical, they are the true patriot, and so on and so forth, um, but they, also let other people just uh, express what they feel they are, um, you know, their political leanings. And it, it just, it was part of this wave of flags and, and it didn't interfere. <clears throat> um, 
in Jerusalem, uh, it was even more important to find the middle, like a common ground for everyone, because it's a, it's a very um, segregated city. It's uh, there are uh, it's a very tense city. Um, so um, you know, they there was this decision that we uh, we just give voice to everyone. It's not that we um, we're trying to shut down anyone. We give voice to everyone. So. Uh, the speakers in the in the demonstrations on on Saturday night, <laughs> excuse me, would be like uh, you know an Arab social worker from East Jerusalem, uh, next to a rabbi from a settlement, next to a university professor, uh, next to a pop star who comes to sing. So they just made a fine found a way to uh, to let everybody be heard. Um, speaking of professors. Uh, Alongside the organization I mentioned, uh, the academia was spread, spreadheading the struggle against the reform. Um, especially some academic organizations, uh, union like uh, law scholars against reform, the union of social workers, professors, uh, social work professors, and so on. Um, but also, uh, but also others like the Hebrew University, for example, that organized uh, educational meetings next to. The big demonstrations you can see here, some kind of Hyde Park. Uh, professor, we would go and, and you know, um, from our expertise, would um, give interpretation of what we see and, and so forth. So this this element of political education was part of that. Um, after a few weeks, the uh, the protests through the organization that led it turned into a well orchestrated operation. Which raised huge amounts of donations, made sure representative will be constantly in commercial media and social media, brought hundreds of thousands of protesters each week over nine months. Now, while the government continued to state that it, it has the right and, uh, and power to move on with the legislation. Um, and tried to push it forward. The protest uh, had several achievements that stalled it. And by October 2023, the protest was on the verge of stopping it. Um, there were only two laws that passed. One was uh, marginal, um, a very personal law about Netanyahu that he cannot be um, um, he cannot be uh, prevented from being uh, prime minister. Um, and the other one, the, the court actually ruled against it, so they, um, they had a problem with that. So uh, that's where we were in October, beginning of October. Then came October 7. The attack on October 7 shocked Israel, as I mentioned before. It, uh, it took at least two, three days before Israel officially gained control on the territories next to the Gaza border. Netanyahu himself was uh, out of reach. You couldn't find him, um, and for and for weeks, even if he gave interviews, it would be only with uh, a group of vetted people because he was afraid that people will lynch him. Basically, um, during the first days, hundreds of civilians who survived the initial attack were still hiding in a territory held by Hamas. In the absence of the military, civilians, some of them retired generals. Uh, took the initiatives, drove into the territories, and picked up the survivors they could find. So it, it was it was growing. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of civilians sought to escape towns uh, near the borders, both in Gaza and next to Lebanon. Uh, but government were uh, the government was um, practically shut down. They couldn't find uh, any way to uh, coordinate that. The ones that could escape found themselves as refugees in their own country. Some of them without food, most of them without employment or school for the kids, and so on. As the military started to draft its reserve forces, it realized that uh, it was not ready for it. They relied, now the soldiers relied on donations for a variety of necessities, from food to bulletproof vests. Farmers across Israel found themselves without workers. Many foreign workers just left. Uh, many fields were close to the borders, so they couldn't, um, they couldn't farm. Into the void rushed the organization I mentioned before. Um, they had the infrastructure, the list of activists, the network of donation, the experience of to in coordinated work with other organizations. 
familiarity with suppliers, ability to mobilize people fast and transfer them across the country and so forth. Um, oh yeah, that's October 7. Um, it includes several uh, war rooms, civilian war rooms across the country to coordinate uh, war, uh, like hot meals and food and, and uh, groceries and, and clothing for, for people who need it. Um, the evacuation I talked before, uh, bringing food, medical supply, uh, as you can see, as you can see here, this one is in, in Jerusalem, organized by the by our students, um, helping farmers. But oh, that's the rescuing, um, helping farmers. You have one of me to prove that I was there. Um, yeah, crazy stuff. Um, so, uh, and, and they, they also improvised school for, for evacuees. The consensus within the organizations was that this take precedence over protest at the moment, and that protest will resume, I quote, after the war. The problem was that uh, Netanyahu decides when the war will be over. The, prote the protest movement practically um, paralyzed or killed itself by promising to resume when the war will end. Um, and mo moreover, they ameliorated the crisis and enabled the incompetent government to survive uh, the public rage and made it appear in retrospect as, as if all things went uh, just fine. Mm -hmm. There is another problem. The war heavily challenges the coalition uh, of protesters. Not only the anti-occupation uh, anti movement, which demands the end of the war immediately and emphasize the Palestinian casualties, uh, they were a minority within this coalition, okay. Um, but also at the core of the coalition, they were, uh, there was now a new, a new conflict. The main question now uh, within the protesters camp um, was and still is, should Israel priori should Israel's priority be the lives of the hostages, and therefore it should seek a ceasefire now? Or should the priority be the uh, annihilation of Hamas? That's the government, what the government called it, which means continuing the fight and sacrificing the hostages. Netanyahu cleverly sees this conflict, and he starts to identify the hostages' first campaign as a Hamas collaborators, um, while associating them with the protest in the previous months. So he killed two birds in one stroke. As it stands today, Netanyahu declares that the war will go on for as long as it takes, uh, and that in any case, there will be no early elections and the reform plan uh, is still on. Uh, and the policies of this government shows that uh, he actually goes in this direction. We don't know how far it will go, but he goes in this direction. The civil organizations that came to the rescue in October are under um, constant attack by the government. The bottom line, these organizations gave the current coalition the time to recuperate, change the discourse, and continue with its plan. So the, the great opportunity to stop a, a long-term trajectory um, actually died with, the, with Hamas uh, attack. You see the question mark, right? <laughs> Historians are particularly terrible in predicting the future. I don't pretend to know where it is all going. Perhaps the end of the war will bring back the protest, uh, now more rigorous and angry. Perhaps the protest movement will be fragmented and ineffective after the inner conflict. Perhaps the, in the end of, of it all, the Israelis will be just too tired to go on with protest. I stand by what I said before, though. Going back to where we were in January 2023 will be the end of Israel as a democracy. But let's let's end with an optimistic image. <laughs> That's the best I can give. Thank you very much. Yes, we we'll have to take some questions. We'll yes, yes, thank you. Know, also, if we can add some of our kind of folks on the Zoom. For those who are on Zoom and want to ask questions, please send them through the chat.
fine, sorry. <laughs> I can get to the talk. I guess um I'm curious what why is this optimistic to you? Why is this the use the optimistic end or why is this photo for you? Protest. Oh, I don't know. I chose both of my daughters smiling. Uh -huh. um, um, yeah. I don't know. I really, I, I looked at the, an image to end this talk with something, with something positive, and I, I didn't know what. So that's what I think. <laughs> Okay. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I do like. Please go ahead. Um, so, with the end of Israeli democracy, what exactly do you think will replace it? What sort of government do you think? As I, as I said before, like really, you're asking the wrong person for, yeah. for predictions. But um, look, there are there are different. Models of, of limited democracy or non liberal democracies. Uh, there is a the whole scale that goes, you know, into a, a populist democracy of the kind we, we've seen in, in many places. It can be, it can be like Poland or, or Hungary now, it can be like Germany in the 30s, right? Um, the problem is with Israel is that it doesn't. It's not. It doesn't belong to the European Union. It, um, you know, it doesn't have. It, it doesn't have a constitution. It doesn't have many other um, balances and, and that can, you know, help with with uh, bringing it to a moderate type of, of non-liberal democracy. So that that's where my fear um, goes to. Um, but I don't know. I mean, if the protests uh, shows us something, it is that, that there is a very strong opposition to, at least to the more radical um, model. So I don't know. Yes. <clears throat> I guess if we're, if we're looking 10 years down the line or so and, and current demographic trends continue and the secular Israeli left um, feels that the formal levers of politics are are out of their reach and they've been they've been entirely captured by 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 the religious right. Do you envision that there might even be there might be a disillusionment with democracy, like honestly a, a turn against democracy by the secular left once they feel that the numbers just don't check out anymore in their favor. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. I don't. It, it, it doesn't match the trajectories that we see uh, today. So um, the left is in Israel is traditionally. I mean, there is no communist left or non-democratic left really. So the left is mostly leaning towards. Uh, um, you know, liberal democracy with the idea that the liberal democracy is where uh, this is the place where you you have some kind of protection from from the government, right? And so even if you are a constant minority, you will have certain rights. Yes. Oh, sorry. No, that's good. Um, I think like in the wake of October 7th, like a good portion of the population was mobilized to the military. And this population will come back eventually, uh, like yeah, when the war finishes. And when that happens, how will they, they will, will they like align with the civil society in this like, it's also a question if it's gonna happen or not, this unification of civil society after the war finishes back into protests, as you said. Will they align with civil society in the same way, or will they? Would you think it's going to branch out into something new, like the military? The people that come back from the military experience are going to have a different take on it. I don't know. Uh, you know, if you think of the history of protests in Israel, so the I mentioned the one in seventy four after the after the Yom Kippur War, uh, which happened when the soldiers came back. Uh, very angry in, in protesting. I, I'm not sure this will be. I mean, the, the Yom Kippur was three weeks. 
right? People people stayed and drafted for a long time, but the war ended and, and people started to go for vacations and, and join the protesters and so on. Um, this is a different case. And, and it comes after so many months of protests. People are really tired. If one of the reasons you don't see anything now is people are exhausted mentally. Yes. Um, so, Jeff, you said that um, I wanted to ask you, so even this summer, um, I was in Israel, I attended these protests this summer for the Day Shabbat, and there was, even then, before October 7th, there was a lot of murmuring and talking about the Constitution, Israel must ratify the Constitution, the new Constitution, there was a lot of talk about that before October 7th. And then, after October 7th, that kind of got pushed to the background. Do you think that eventually, the question of constitution is going to come back to where it was last summer and then even in full force that um that the question of the constitution is going to come like to the front of the mind of like the nation and the politicians like in general as um like seeing this like 2023 is like a watershed year for uh, like, the Israeli government essentially look the question of constitution is, is a very good one because um it, Politically, it's going to be very hard mm -hmm. to to reach an agreement for that. And one of the things that the protesters did to bypass that is instead of talking about the constitution, talking about the uh, Megillat Atzmaut, the, um, the Declaration of Independence, the Israeli Declaration of Independence, which um, actually promises uh, equality for all and, uh, and, and all the, these principles that liberal democracy can live with. It doesn't, by the way, it doesn't say anything about democracy, but, mm -hmm. but the principles of it. Um, so, so the idea was to talk about that and, and in this way to, to um, integrate these uh, human rights principles, equality principles, without having to reach an agreement about the by constitution. Do you think it's possible to do that by uh, everything is possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a really, I think that it's just a, a politically very hard thing to do. Um, because and one of the one of the reason we we reach this crisis now is that because for for decades, um, every Israeli government tried to somehow maintain a status quo on these issues without really asking, you know, what should we do about it. Is the, the you can't you couldn't have any coalition to, that agrees on the principles. Yes, so we asked you uh, unfairly to cease being a historian and kind of become a predictive political scientist, and I'll I'll shift maybe ninety degrees and ask you to be a bit of a sociologist. I mean, one of the questions that came up immediately after October seventh was whether um, any of the responsive civil society would scramble in meaningful senses some of the kind of fairly sedimented tensions in the society. So, and one of those, one of the interesting dimensions of the attack was that it attacked both centers of a very particular kind of the Ashkenazi, Jewish, mostly left-leaning kind of kibbutz milieu, and a place like Stel, right? So, which is associated with um, the Jews of the uh, background from the North African, the Arab world. And these are understood as sort of very different parts of society facing off in the political sphere. But so one of the questions was, would the kind of contact between civil society and the world of folks in Stavol, for instance, serve in some ways to reshuffle that relationship or open up? And then the counter argument was no, on the contrary, by all the natural sort of all the natural movement along would be along the lines of the existing networks. And so people would set up schools for the kibbutz kids, but no one would be there for the Stavol kids, right? So I mean, you were you saw some of this and you've been watching maybe not from a distance. Do you have any sense of any kind of movement on sort of what's called social side of this situation? Yeah, so let me I'll give you a, a few different answers. The first one is that in the first weeks after the, the attack, it looked like there's going to be like an earthquake that will shift the tectonic, you know, the metaphor, right? Um, because there was, people were, were enraged and, and, and they really thought the government left them and that, you know, that 
this the, really they they should actually go together with with people who really have their interests in mind and uh, uh, you know it doesn't matter if you're Ashkenazi, Mizrahi, or whatever. Um, but that changed after like three or four weeks. And people came back to the same to the same language. Uh, and that's one of Netanyahu's great success is that he really, you know, he made it about um, you know Palestinian state, right, and not about how the government just disappeared. And, um, and how about his own policy over the years actually brought us to where we are. Um, but the but the discourse has shifted back. That's one thing. The other thing is, and I think it's this is not an answer, but it's just to to emphasize the, what you were talking about. Um, everything that was in like you know 10, 15 uh, miles from the borders um, was ruined either by uh, shells or or Hamas people or just people were panicking and, and leaving everything. Um, but some communities, the, the, the kibbutzim communities, they you know they were first they were organized to begin with, but then you know they had places to go. Um, many people from other places just didn't have anywhere to go. But it was even it was much worse, and that that's actually blew my mind when I saw it. Um, so when when I was in this uh, the civilian war room, um, I would. Like answer answer the phone calls from people who don't have food and uh, and try to coordinate with the you know people who get to them with with half meals. Um, you see that after a week or so, you know, fourteen so two weeks after the attack, the Ashkenazi ultra orthodox stopped coming to us. They were set, right, because their communities. Um, took care of it in, in Jerusalem, the, the community in Jerusalem. The Mizrahi ones, the Shas supporters, they were left all by themselves. Like they didn't have any support, even though they actually did have ultra orthodox communities in Jerusalem. But the, you know, whatever ideological gap between them uh, was enough for them not to have. So they would come, they would get to us. And the last observation that I will have here. Um, no, I, I got an answer. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. So, um, again, thank you for the talk. Um, there's different views about correlating what happened on uh, 10 7 with either uh, the protest movement, the, the perception that the protest movement showed a weakness of Israeli society, or the refocusing on the West Bank. Um, ignored what was going on in, in Gaza, and that they had been warned by multiple, very often female units of intelligence that were completely, um, I guess, ignored completely in terms of that there was something planning that they, they had perceived that there was a threat. And then there's a third issue is like, depending on how long they think it took to plan, can you pinpoint, in your opinion, the rest of society was this sort of weakening weakening Israel to make it more vulnerable to an attack, or was this attack inevitable because of the tensions that you up, you laid out in your talk? Look, uh, yeah, intel intelligence about what Hamas is going to do. Everybody knew it. It was on the news in Israel, you know, in the. In the Few years before that, um, it was a it was a conscious decision of the of Netanyahu's government and also the government that was in between the so Netanyahu is in office since, since two thousand nine but in between there was one year of another government uh, there too uh, the idea was that you know we we actually don't want to solve uh, a problem with the Palestinians because that means concession of, of land. Um, Politically and ideologically, that's not what we want. We want to somehow maintain the situation. Maintaining the situation means that you know, we will deal with whatever comes, right? So, so what you mentioned before that there were like, some female um, um, soldiers who, who worked in intelligence and so that that's true. But you don't need to be a soldier. You could you could read it in the papers. 
um, the claims of attack. There was uh, even like a, a, a news show a couple of years before that that showed what what they're planning. It was planned. Um, the the protesters, of course, were are still accused by the you know they were weakening the um, but but you know I think it's uh, I think it's nonsense. I think it's nonsense because um, you know the protesters were actually the ones to um, to pay for it, for these policies, right? Um, you know they were they were the ones um, that unlike the government, the people in the government, you know, almost all of them either haven't served, their children don't serve in the military, and so forth. So um, you know, so they don't represent uh, the the public that. Does serve. They don't represent uh, the middle class that pays larger taxes and so forth. So uh, they, you know, they had a reason to be to be heard. That their voice will be heard. Um, moreover, the the minister of defense, the Daniel minister of defense, told him that what he's doing is actually weakening the country. That they told him in, in March, and that for that reason, the Daniel fired him. Uh, the demonstrations uh, went to the streets after that, and Netanyahu backed uh, from from his from firing him, right? In a in a classic Netanyahu way to say I, but I said I didn't really say. Um, so so it was clear to to the government that what they're doing actually weakening the country, uh, but they went on with it because they really didn't, didn't care. That, but but. This is totally my personal opinion. This is not based on any any historical uh, research. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, your presentation, you mentioned that there was a liberal middle class, and in that case, uh, which kind of social economic groups were the supporters of the Netanyahu government, and what have they been doing after the October seventh attack? If you mentioned, like, it's mainly the protesters that were doing all these. Uh, civilian kind of uh, supporting mechanisms where the supporters of the government do that. So, so for the, the so Netanyahu's coalition um, has um, so ultra orthodox, uh, like almost like 20, between 25 and 30 percent ultra orthodox, um, which actually most of them belong to the to the lower classes. Many of them very poor. Um, so that's it. You have um, another twenty five percent to thirty percent is uh, is uh, settlers, uh, and among the settlers there are variations. Of, you know, some of them are, you know, normative uh, middle class people, but live uh, in the in the West Bank um, with, you know, you would. You would call them, you know, liberal right wing, um, um, and and it goes all the way to to you know, plainly racist, um, you know, people who would say that they are for apartheid and they they are for they, they are for um, race based laws, um, and, and some of the the very prominent ministers in these governments are like that. And the rest, around 40%, are uh, Netanyahu's party, um, which is uh, some middle class, some lower middle class. Um, but there is, a, there is a big gap between the, uh, the party voters and the party, party representatives, which are um, now in this parliament, the party representatives are much more to the right, much less liberal than the, than the voters. Um, well, it's, it's short. <laughs> Entering to something much, much bigger than that, which is where Israel is today. And uh, but a new focus primarily on um, protests. And um, um, what worries me, and um, many other things that worry me, is that um, there is this. Um, but there is a trend of people, a sobering up people, 
And they're sobering up from the idea that you can ever sit down, negotiate with Palestinians. They would not go for two-state solution. Look who are dealing with, and so on and so forth. Many of those people were uh, part of the demonstration uh, organization 2023. So uh, among many other things, you know, there is uh, also this sober up that I don't see what it has to do with anything, but that's just my private opinion. My other question or comment is like, if, if Israel is maybe going in the way that you perceive all the people like you, because people like you are my friends and my family in Israel, and I'm like, and I don't see those who are uh, the, the Achim Laneshev, the brothers in arms, and I don't see those people giving up on, on the state of Israel. They're striving in the state of Israel. Many of them come from Haitech. And so Israel, as, as an idea, is very, very, very dear to their hearts. Yeah, so um, there are two things that you mentioned. One of them is the, the sobering now. And here again, this is a very clever uh, maneuver of the of the Netanyahu's, um, Netanyahu's media, um, basically seeing that the protesters they, they have a coalition that is uh, diverse, and you can um, you know you can find the, the place where they they cannot as protesters as a movement they cannot answer you, um, and then you know it. In the first the first weeks after the attack, it was clear to everyone that um, the point was that you know for for fifteen maybe twenty years the point was that you you're not you're not talking to the Palestinians and you're weakening the Palestinian authorities, uh, strengthening the Hamas because this status quo is good for you. Yeah. So the whole Netanyahu experiment is uh, just to you know to to win time, uh, because something might happen. Um, but that changed quickly because, because of a very clever um, propaganda, mainly, uh, you know. So the problem was that people tried to talk with Palestinians, even though we didn't talk with Palestinians, right? Um, so that's what we should not do. And we should continue what we did until now, but it worked very well, right? Um, but it, but it, it, it works. And you're right. The question: What will happen in uh, you know a few months from now? Like everybody comes down, and then um, you know people will ask, okay, what what really happened? And that may be bring to a, bring a, a change. I don't know. Um, yeah. What what will people do? Um, my father always said to me, um, you know, with with opinions like yours, you should you should learn how to swim. <laughs> so, um, so, but <laughs> that's how we function. Um, look, there are there are there are scenarios. Uh, we know from other places, uh, like in Lebanon, for example, there it's, uh, there was a brain drainage, uh, or or you know people the upper middle class drainage and so forth. People who could left. Um, we see it among the Palestinians, um, but it doesn't have to be like that, right? And um, you know, Israel society somehow got over some terrible crisis in, in, in the past, right? From you know the, the Rabin assassination and, and the Al Aqsa Intifada and its uh, aftermath and, and everything going on in the last five years um, with, with you know five elections with like five elections in four years, something like that. So. You know, and, and it brought to the process. It, it didn't bring it, bring us to to uh, surrender of the of the democracy. So, so maybe we can be optimistic. I, I don't know. I'm making the choice to speak. Um, how do you understand the relation between the Arab minority in Israel and the Protestant? One thing that. I noticed like if you do the comparison that you talk about with the 2011, she never Arabs participate. But here it's like completely absent, like not like you 
the Burley, among all the Israeli flags, don't see the air. Uh, so, first of all, how how we can how can we understand like things like from the protests from from the Arabs? How how is it there, and where does it go? But also, also we passed double seven minutes. Like I think there's like different discourse about Palestinian citizens in Israel. Something like on, on the one on the one side, like um, on one hand, a bit patronizing and being proud of them. Not really despise, despite the uh, Ben Gears uh, provocation on that. And on the other hand, it's kind of like raising racism, following the law. Like, that's very good. It's a very good point. Uh, about the, the, the Arab population uh, during the, the demonstrations, um, they were there, but not a lot. I mean, it's not that they were totally absent, but. Um, but they were not in you know, the masses coming to demonstrations. Um, there were, there were, it, it, you know, there were several reasons for that. Um, part of it was the whole, you know, flags and patriotic ideas uh, seemed to them strange you know, to be uh, to be part of that. Um, the other part is that the protesters themselves didn't want to give them too much stage, so it wouldn't look, look like a you know, radical left protest. Um, with I, I think the big exception is in Jerusalem, where they, they were on the stage, not so much in the, in the crowd. Uh, but that has to do with the fact that the Arab population near Jerusalem is in East Jerusalem or the West Bank, they couldn't just come in participate. Um, that was one of the major problems of the of the movement, I think. Uh, they couldn't mobilize the, the Arabs. Uh, but there was support. It wasn't resentment. There were there were some Arab intellectuals who who you know said you know, how can you leave us outside and, and but by and large it it was not um, um, it was not something that, that became the, the problem that people thought at the beginning that it will be, that, you know, we, we, we never mobilize enough people if we want to mobilize the Arabs. They, um, you know, from the protesters' point of view, they, they could do it and without paying the, the price of people having the Arabs. Um, about the, what, what happens now, uh, you know, the government, especially Ben Gvir, um, they're trying. To provocate the the Arab population, trying you, very hard. <laughs> yeah, they try very hard, um, and and the Arabs, I think there there's this catch twenty two because um, you know when just like you said, if they don't do anything, they, um, they you know the left talks about them in, in a patronizing way, you know, say the good Arabs behave the, the way we want them to, to behave, and the, and the right says, oh that, that's because we're tough on them, that's why they're not. Uh, and if they say anything, they, um, you know, they are like the, the fifth columns and, and you know, terrorists and, and so forth. So they are really, um, they are really, you know, people. I, I, I'm not sure where, where it goes, but I'm pretty sure that the, again, the, the opposition must somehow recruit them into the community. 